Ladies and gentlemen, this is a giant step for Manchester United fans as Sir Jim Ratcliffe held his first press conference after being confirmed as the minority co-owner of Manchester United, holding his 25% share. Well, this is the moment that we fans have been waiting for Sir Jim Ratcliffe to speak directly to. Let us know what is the plan, how do you feel? Now, I will share this video. I will make my reaction because I haven't watched it. So this is the first time fan reaction. Let's do this together. Let's have a look and comment. Sir Jim, we are delighted to say officially, welcome to the Manchester United family. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations. Yeah. You said in your recent statement that the transaction is completed, but this is just the beginning of your journey as co-owner of the club. So tell me how it feels. Oh, I mean, it feels wonderful, obviously. It's, it, it, um, you, you sort of have to pinch yourself a little bit. It's not something I could never have contemplated when I was, I was younger, obviously. So it is a bit of a boyhood dream, I suppose, that they're not supposed to come true, but in this case, obviously, it did. Well, look at his uh, face. It's like a proud, like a boy that just went through a candy store and, and got all these candies. Proud as punch. Look at that smile. Look at that pride. And... You know what? Let's continue to hear how did we end up getting to this way. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very proud moment, and uh, you know I'm very honoured to to be able to help take United forward. Tell us how you got to this moment. Then, obviously, we know a lot's happened since Christmas Eve. But how did we actually get to this moment before that? Now, this is the moment that I am dying to hear. It's been a long circus over 12 months now. How do we get to here? This is the moment. This is the moment of truth. Let's go. Well, I, I'd obviously, you know, as, as, as you do really in football, you, you choose your football side when you're very young and you stick with it for, for life, really. So, yeah. you know, when I was at school in Manchester, I suppose, you know, I don't know how old, six or seven or something like that. I was at primary school in, uh, in Failsworth and half the class wore pale blue and half the class wore red, but, you know, my... My family were were red, so and that's where I've you know I've been all my life really. So I've always been a passionate supporter of Manchester United, and that's what I want to hear. You know, half of the class was pearl blue, half the class was red, and his family were all reds. But the, bear in mind, Manchester United is the biggest club in the world, and my family generation goes in two generations, and I'm also a very passionate fan. Although my brother he supports the wrong Reds, Liverpool, black sheep of the family. Big up, Jim. Let's continue. Um, and, um, you know, more recently in my life, we've got involved in sport. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, we have a collection of quite interesting sports positions in Formula One, and cycling and a couple of football clubs, as you know, the America's Cup. Um, <clears throat> but we, we always had our eye on a, a Premier League football club uh you know to complete that sort of collection of sport yeah but you know he he, he tried to bid for chelsea you guys remember and he came late so of course this is a um, giant moment for sir jim ratcliffe and of course they got the price on the crown jewel of english football let's continue assets that we we wanted to look at managing as a, a group and looking for for benefits and um, synergies from running a, a group of sort of sports enterprises. You know, one day the, the Manchester United opportunity uh, came on the horizon and, um, you know, I suppose the rest is history, really. Yeah, I do remember the interview he did with the Forbes magazine and when he said, uh, you know, Manchester United, uh, you know, is owned by the six siblings, the Glazers, and they're the nicest of people and it's not for sale, but it turned out it was a little bit for sale. So. Let's continue hearing Jim's story here. Uh, but it, it was a long, <coughs> you know, effectively we had to play the long game. It was a complicated transaction. It took obviously well over a year. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it required a fair degree of patience, which is, oh, yeah. I wouldn't say is one of my finest attributes. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Imagine being a Manchester United fan and going through this, this process. It's been madness. It's been a long, windy circus of spin of patience. Patience, you're talking about patience? Come on, Jim. You know what we fans went through. But anyway, 
we have come to the end of the road and you became the winner. So congratulations. It's, uh, uh, so that was quite difficult, but, um, but you know, good things never come easy. And, no, um, you know, eventually we got, we got over the finishing line. So. Hmm. Can you describe your vision for the club on and off the pitch? Oh, this is the very important question. The vision on and off the pitch. This is pretty much what is your plan? Well, on the pitch <clears throat> is really simple. I, I think the, the only interest we have is in winning football matches. And, yeah. Uh, competing for the Premier League and competing for the Champions League. So. Because the Glazers never had that interest. And of course, what he's saying here, we want to win at all costs. We want to bring Manchester United back to the top, isn't it? That's, that's, that's our only interest in being involved in Manchester United. That yeah. is what Manchester United is about. It's, you know, in my, I mean, maybe I'm slightly biased, but I think it's the, you know, it's the biggest and the greatest and the most well-known football club in the world. And a hundred percent, even if we haven't won a Premier League title for 11 years or a Champions League for 14 years, we're the most spoken about club in the world. So it should always be competing for, yeah, you know, the league title and the Champions League title, always. Um, always. So that's that's how we have to measure ourselves in terms of what are our expectations off the pitch, if you like it. I mean, that's just about values, I think. And, you know, we, you know, Manchester United does stand for certain values. It's got a style of football. It's got, you know, a, a code of values by which it... True, but we our style of football has kind of vanished, and uh, so we need to try to reinvent ourselves. The DNA and the values are still there. The never say die, you know, the Fergie time. But yeah, let's continue. I'm really excited to hear more about this vision regarding the cultural reset. You know, people have to respect, um, and um, so you know we would expect people to do that. What can be people and fans expect from the equity injection then? I know there's been lots of talk um, about Old Trafford, for example. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, this is the question about the Old Trafford. And uh, this is the double-edged sword that, you know, either you build a new stadium next to it or you refurbish Old Trafford. Um, very tricky question. If you look at our role at Manchester United, there, there, there are two key issues that, that we have to address. One, one is the football, which is performance on the field, really, which is, is yeah. always going to be our priority for Manchester United. But, but the second one, the second big issue, really, in the club, you know, which a lot of people talk about and are conscious of, is, the, is where the stadium sits today. You know, the stadium, yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's an impressive stadium and it's the largest Premier League stadium in the country, second largest stadium in the country to Wembley, I suppose. Um, but it, it's not quite of the standard you would expect of Manchester United to no, of course not. It's been left there to rust for 18 years. And this is a far crime by itself. And um, yeah, let's continue. Hopefully you have something good to say about it. Today, and it's fallen behind. Maybe 20 years ago it was, but today yes. it's fallen behind. So yep. we do need to look at the way forward for, for the, um, the stadium, the redevelopment of that stadium. There are clearly you know, two roads we could take. We could refurbish the existing stadium. Mm. We could... We could look at building a new stadium, and that's um, that's what we're looking at at the moment. So the, basically, there's two alternatives. Hasn't really been decided. Um, there's two roads. When he says either refurbished Old Trafford or build a new stadium, the latest and greatest up in the north. And what about Carrington training complex? Has that been in your mind as well? That's important. Yeah, but I think it's secondary to to Old Trafford. Carrington is, you know, he's. Fairly impressive, I think. I quite, I quite like Carrington as a facility. Hang on a second. Second to the stadium. I disagree because the players are training there every day. Cristiano Ronaldo came back and said nothing has changed for 18 years. Since, you know, it, nothing has changed. Same equipment, same facilities. What about the sport? What are the, about the medical science department? Nah, man, this is out of date what I've been hearing. This is the first thing you should address. Hey, the latest and greatest in sports science, in physio, in terms of training facilities. That is the first thing. Because why? Players are training every day and we have to prepare for matches. Stadium can come within one or two years. That's my opinion, Jim. Um, I mean, I think there are things that we can do to improve it, but I don't think they're of the magnitude that, uh, that, that sort of 
the stadium requires. Improvement means in terms of facilities, in terms of equipment. Yeah, I mean, the pitch is there to train, the gym is there, but you, you should have the latest and greatest and you should make players feel like this is a home, this is a rehab center, this is where I come to practice, right? Probably that's why he said, probably need to, you know, refurbish it a bit, build it up. You've obviously spent time at Carrington. You've spent lots of time Old at Old Trafford recently. What's it been like for you as a fan and now a co-owner? Well, I think, I mean, it's obviously fascinating to, to step inside the, uh, the doors. Um, but we've been very welcomed by people. People have, you know, it's a... It's a sort of Manchester, sort of Lancastrian trait, isn't it? That you work mm. and people are friendly and chatty. So, you know, I would have expected that anyway, I suppose. But <clears throat> no, it's been, um, you know, it's been an interesting journey so far. Mm. And you've spent time with Sir Alex Ferguson, of course. Yeah. I actually was <clears throat> listening to an old interview that you had done a couple of years ago when you were asked for your three dream dinner guests. <laughs> and you did actually say Sir Alex Ferguson, but you <laughs> Yeah, no, he's Sir Alex's biggest fan, 100%. He's admitted that before, so look at his smirk. Look at his smirk. <laughs> I love it. I had actually mentioned him, or met him, sorry, once before, but he was on your dream dinner list. Yes, I'm trying to remember. And look where we him. are now. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I think it was, um, I think it was, it was either Nelson or Nelson Mandela. Yeah. One of those two. I know it had or Nelson Winston in it. Winston Churchill. Yeah, I've met Sir Alex uh, uh, two or three times since uh, since Christmas, and I knew him a little bit anyway. Um, I mean, it's, you know, he, he's um, he's a you know the world's iconic coach, and he's he's just a, an essential part of that. Man. Yeah, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. Look at him, <laughs> proud as punch. Now you get to meet Sir Alex Ferguson almost every day if you are around. <laughs> to be honest, now I like this story. Just United history i mean he has made history for manchester united in those 27 years he was there really and uh, you know he was the greatest manager of his generation in terms of immersing yourself into the club and meeting sir alex ferguson that's what it's all about isn't it and as i said you've been attending uh, matches what have you thought of the atmosphere at old trafford recently oh i think um i mean since we signed on christmas eve um it's, um, <clears throat> you know, the team, I think, has played really, really well. They've been really committed. They've play, played very cohesively, really, as a team. Have they been committed because you've been watching? <laughs> That's a big question. Like, most of us uh, fan base has been watching. Have you been watching before? Um, now you come in and now you've been observing with uh, Dale Braceworth in the stand. Of course, the team has been noticing we need to be on the best behavior otherwise we're going to be on the chopping block they, you know they were they were a bit sporadic i absolutely take my hat off to them since christmas they played really well and yep. i know you've met uh, many of the staff members as well and although this club is a huge commercial power is this investment for you more about heart than money Ooh. yeah i'm not i'm not interested in the financial aspects of oh so He's not interested in the financial. It's more heart here by this side. But let me see the body language. No investment at all, really, because I make, you know, I make enough money in chemicals and oil and gas. Really, I don't. It's, it's yeah. not a. This is not a financial investment. It's, a, it's, it's, a, you know, it's because I'm interested in um, seeing Manchester United being successful again. It hasn't been successful the last eleven years, but it needs to get back to where it should be, which is at the top of the game. That looks like a man speaking directly from my heart. So look at his body language, look at his facial expression. Absolutely smashing, you know. He's got a personal wealth by himself, troll is limited. He's got four billion in cash liquidity laying around. So yeah, he said himself, like I made enough money already. You know, what can you do? Like, you know, if I had a billion dollars or billion pounds, I wouldn't even know what to do with it. So, of course, this is more of a vanity project. He wants to see Manchester United come back to the top again. And I believe him because if I read the body language, if I see, you know, how his facial expressions, they looks very genuine. How important are the fans for the success of the team? You know, you've been a fan. You've seen yeah. they can often be the 12th man on that pitch. On well, that, that, that's like that. what the club's all about is the fans. Really. They, I, I've always said that, 
you know, we, we don't own the club. You know, the, these shareholders, you know, myself and the Glazer family, we don't own the club. The, the true owners of the club, the fans, the community, and, and we're merely guardians or stewards for a period of time of the club. We don't own the club. The club is a community asset. Wow. Wow. We don't own the club. Basically, it's a community asset. It is fans that should own the club. But where is our fan share ownership? But in a way, what you're saying that we are just custodians, guardians of the club. You see, people, football used to be like this. Football used to be, you know, a, a working man's class. You can pay like, you know, one pound to go and watch a game. And that was it. But now the increase of season ticket holders, tickets in general, you almost have to be like, you know, a high earner to even afford a season ticket. So how are you going to address that, Jim? And so it's all about the fans, really. Really? Uh, you know, and what the fans want, uh, because it's really, really important to, you know, those those people who live in Manchester go to the game every week. But not only the people that live in Manchester and go to the games, Jim. What about the global fan base? What about what the global fan base wants? I mean, I hope you have something more to say about this. They want to see the team winning because that's so enjoyable for everybody. And, um, you know, and we recognize that. So hang on. Pause for a second. You didn't go. You didn't. You just didn't say that. So basically in your statement in your manifesto you said to put manchester back into manchester united and you just said here for the match going fans and people that living in manchester <laughs> we have over five million outside that supports this club this giving you revenues guys just a friendly reminder a little bit of disappointed with that answer so no it's all about the fans I'm all sure travelling up to Old Trafford brings out that little boy inside of you going to a yeah, match day. You know, yeah, you can go sure. to matches anywhere in London or around the world, but making that trip to Old Trafford, yeah. going through yeah. posher turnstiles. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when I used to stand on the, uh, the Stratford End in those days, when they were all standing, yeah, yeah. It brings back the memories, really. But uh, yeah, there's nothing like going to Old Trafford. Yeah, it's mm. incredible. And finally, okay. this is your first opportunity to publicly address the fans. What would your message be to them? Well, uh, here we go. So the message to the fans, I think, <clears throat> come on, absolutely our priority with Manchester United is yeah. performance on the pitch. So oh, performance on the pitch, yes. We want Manchester United to be challenging for the Premier League. Challenge. Hundred percent. Want Manchester United to channel for Premier League titles and everything for the Champions League. Champions League. <clears throat> That's what Manchester United is about. It's yep. you know it's the greatest club in the world. So it should be playing the greatest football in the world. Hundred um, percent. But it's not light switch. We can't just switch a switch and all of a sudden, United <clears throat> are going to be playing football at the level of of Real Madrid. Yeah, hundred percent. This is a change that Manchester United fans has to be patient. Rome wasn't built in one day. It's not like a switch of an eye, like a light switch, what you're saying, and I agree that things will be just like that. Um, because they haven't been for the last 11 years. That takes time and it takes a bit exactly. of patience. The important thing is, I think, that we all observe the trajectory mm -hmm. of Manchester United over the next two or three seasons, and the trajectory yes. has to be in a good direction. So I think that's how I think we should be measured. The trajectory in two to three seasons meaning two transfer windows three transfer windows meaning that we're building from the top the right people the best in class people on board and we recruit the best wow that is a trajectory people i, I would ask for a bit of patience patience but ultimately you know the performance of the club does sit on our shoulders my mm -hmm. shoulders particularly but also you know, Dave Brailsford, who's going to be intimately involved, and, uh, and the rest of the people at the club, obviously. Of course, performance, because you're in charge of the football operations. You want to get Manchester United back on the winning ways as soon as possible. But at the same time, I agree with Jim is saying. Our fan base is not the most patient fan base in the world. <laughs> um, and, you know, we need to take the, you know, the, the rough with the smooth. So if we're successful, that's fine, I think. 
it would be nice to uh, to get a pat on the back for that. But if we're not successful, then it's, you know, it's on our shoulders. So we, mm. we fully accept that responsibility. So full accountability. If we're not successful, we will take that on the shoulder. So he's fully aware. Wow. Um, and we'll be, you know, we're going to be very, very focused on doing all the things that we can. Laser sharp. I like that. Laser sharp focus. We do everything that we can do everything to win. I like that. That is Manchester United high standards. As well as we can to, you know, turn Manchester United into a winning side again. That's that's why we're here. Bravo. I like that. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's it. That's it. That's it. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you think. There was a lot of things to take on board. There's been what he was saying. How do I explain? It's been like, you know, 13, 14 months of not knowing what's going to happen. Um, at the end of the day, we have heard from the horse's mouth what his plan is and what Manchester United means and where Manchester United should be. Now, I want to hear from your opinions, your feelings. This was me for the first time watching this video listening to this video and this is my initial reaction wow first impression great speech well thought putting the club back where it should belong is the first priority asking for patience being humble but there was one minus that i picked up there is when he said speaking to the fans is important and he spoke about the match going fans and people around the Manchester. And that's on a connotation that I have to put a minus there because there's so many other people around the world that are supporting this club that wakes up 5 a.m. in the morning, that don't live around the Manchester area, that don't have the privilege to go to the matches. And these are the ones that are the biggest consumers of the club, right? He said, we are not the owners of Manchester United. Nobody is. It belongs to the community. So for me, that was a little bit more of a disappointing answer. You should have thought about that a little bit broader to say, like, you know, Manchester United is the biggest club in the world, and therefore every fan opinion matters. Anyway, this has been my opinion, my feelings. Um, I will end this video right now, and I need to reflect a little bit more. But please do leave a comment uh, in the comment section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this video, and I should see you to the next one. Be Mick Ruby here, MUFC Real Estate TV. Had her say, and I hope I made you a better day. Goodbye for now.